I did another little video on the difference between bourbon and rye and you guys seem pretty interested in it. It's obviously a massive subject so I thought it was maybe time that we took a little bit of a deeper dive into the world of American whiskey. I had a look around Fitzroy and found the closest thing that I could find to an American who also happens to be a whiskey expert and my boyfriend so it all came together quite nicely. <laughs> uh, so we've got Fred Siggins in here to help me have a little chat through these delicious beverages in front of us. Thank you for having me. No worries. So obviously um, I guess Scottish whiskey tends to have a little bit more romance associated with it, but American whiskey has a pretty a long and illustrious history also. It certainly does. Well, and certainly if you talk to Americans, they will um, generally tell you that their whiskey, their native whiskey, has got just as much romance and intrigue as anything that you would find in Scotland. So I think like a lot of places, the uh, the whiskey that comes from there holds a really special place in those people's hearts. When did they actually start distilling in America? So I think the, the history of whiskey in the United States goes back to European colonization, immigration to that part of the world. Yep. Um, and especially people from the northern parts of Europe where they already had plenty of experience distilling grains into things like whiskey and schnapps. And the first part of the United States, what is now the United States, that those folks settled was the Northeast, um, where rye grain grows particularly well in that climate where it's a little bit colder. So rye would have been the very first whiskey um, to be made in the United States. A lot of the time in classic cocktails, it doesn't actually specify if it's bourbon or rye, it just says whiskey. Um, but it's probably fair, you know, when it's stuff that's coming out of New York in like the 1800s, early 1900s, it's probably going to be rye that it would have been made with. Absolutely. I mean, I think that it's important to remember, like now we can ship stuff all over the world. But for the most part, if you're in Ireland and you walk up to a bar and ask for whiskey, you're going to get Irish whiskey. If you're in Canada and you walk up to a bar and ask for whiskey, you're going to get Canadian whiskey. Obviously, if, in, if you're in Scotland, you're going to get Scotch. And in most of the United States, if you just order a whiskey, you're going to get bourbon or some other form of American whiskey. So yeah, when those recipes don't specify things, you can almost always assume that it's whatever whiskey was being made locally. I did have in the kind of bourbon versus rye, I obviously explained that most American whiskey is with an E. There are a few exceptions, Maker and Smart being one of them spells it without an E. Mm -hmm. Is that sort of the... Um, I guess whether or not it was an Irish or Scottish family almost that would have been making I guess I've always assumed that. I've always assumed that because there were a lot of Irish folks who ended up in the United States and living in uh, whiskey producing areas that that's probably the reason that they have the E. I do think it's important to remember, like probably not to be too fundamentalist about it, that both spellings are actually valid. So, you know, you can have a rule, but you can break it as well. So if rye was the first whiskey that was being made in the States, how did bourbon come about? And sort of, is there a particular reason that it's, it's so, um, I guess linked so heavily with the South. Bourbon is a corn based whiskey as opposed to rye which is based on rye grain and the big difference there is geographical. So what they found is people started to move south and kind of take over territory further down along the eastern seaboard of the US. What they found is that down there that it was corn that actually grew better than rye. So they were using exactly the same techniques and traditions for making whiskey. They were just making it with a local grain that was available. Then they're basically putting it in barrels and shipping it down the river systems, shipping it down the Ohio and the Mississippi River to people in New Orleans, who are the ones who actually have enough money and enough free time to be drinking the stuff. And that's probably where the name Bourbon comes about because Bourbon is the name of the French royal family from the time. Yeah. So it would almost be like a marketing ploy Basically, like as if you were going to call... Trying to make it sound fancy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like as if you were going to call your whiskey uh, House of Windsor or Royal Whiskey or something like that. Yeah. So all of the southern part of the United States and all of the western part, as they started to take over Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, all the way out to California, people were taking that southern corn-based whiskey with them and drinking it in those parts of the country. Yeah, okay, cool. So rye, I feel, kind of was a little bit out of vogue for quite a while, but it ha is having a bit of a resurgence now. During the sort of middle part of the 20th yeah. century, it all sort of fell out of favour. So there were really only a couple of bourbon brands that were surviving and thriving. And because bourbon was more common 
it sort of survived a little bit better, whereas most of the rye whiskies were very, very close to sort of completely going out of business, mm -hmm. except for one or two. And then thankfully in the last 20 years or so, A, people have gotten really interested in classic cocktails and B, people are just pretty into whiskey these days. So you're seeing more rye whiskey brands um, as well as more bourbon brands coming onto the market and being really successful. Another thing I always think is quite interesting about the bourbon industry is again, it's not really like in Scotland where you would go and you've got all of the different distilleries to visit. Like mm. in a lot, of, a lot of bourbon actually comes out of just a few distilleries, right? And then they're all kind of branded and marketed differently. Yeah, it's a much different system than you would find in single malt scotch, for example, where each little individual distillery and hundreds of them around the country have got their own individual style and generally just one label or maybe two that they produce. Yeah. In the United States, the vast majority of bourbon is and, and rye whiskey is produced in about eight or nine really big distilleries, each one of them producing sometimes upwards of 30 or 40 different brands. So some big examples of that would be Buffalo Trace Distillery, Heaven Hill Distillery. Um, and then you've also got some really, really massive distilleries that are pretty focused on only one brand. So stuff like Jack Daniels. I imagine uh, they have to pump quite a lot out yeah, a they year certainly to... do. They certainly do. Um, and Jim Beam would be another one. They produce a few brands, but for the most part, they're focused on just producing Jim Beam bourbon. Yeah. So yeah, it's quite different. Obviously, uh, that kind of American oak sort of vanilla flavor is such a strong indicator of this entire category of spirits. Is there sort of a historical reason for, for how that came about? Yeah, I mean, like a lot of things, it's all kind of pretty shrouded in mystery. And there are a couple of different kinds of research that have gone into figuring out why that is. But it's really important to remember with all American whiskey, certainly at least the stuff that comes from the United States, that by law, it has to be aged in brand new barrels, which means that all American whiskey is gonna be intensely oaky compared to other whiskeys, because it's getting that fresh oak flavor every single time. And there's probably a couple of different reasons behind this, but the thing that probably makes the most sense to me is that if you look at the way that that river system runs down the middle of the United States, all the oak plantations are up north where it's cold, so that's where they're cutting down the trees and turning them into barrels, sending those down the river as they go past the corn growing areas, the whiskey producing areas in Kentucky and Tennessee, then they're getting filled up with whiskey and they're continuing their way on down the river to New Orleans where people are actually drinking them. Now that river only flows in one direction. So there's a geographical reason for only ever using fresh oak, but I also think that, again, going back to the sort of marketing thing, the people in New Orleans, a lot of them were French um, and they were used to drinking very well aged cognacs and brandies from France that would have spent, you know, 20 or 30 years sitting around in an oak barrel, getting that real kind of intense oakiness that we're used to from French brandies. So with the American guys trying to make whiskey to sell it to French people, they're going to try to pack as much oakiness into it in a short amount of time as possible. Yeah. Later in history though, what we see is, um, you know, during the depression and in the post prohibition era, when certain people in certain areas needed to create jobs in their district, that's probably why it got codified in American law, that yeah. you actually have to use fresh barrels every time. Because well, you're actually just then protecting the timber industry basically, because Absolutely. there's always then, you've got a domestic market for it forever. That's it. So you're protecting uh, the, the local industry and the, and the workers in your district, but you're also then protecting that traditional style of American whiskey that you know came about a couple hundred years ago. Well, I think that's a pretty good little sort of introduction to the world of American whiskey. Stick around for the next episode where we'll have a little look at the different styles that we have laid out in front of us.